back in action. Now welcome to the next special meeting of Glendale City Council, June 12, 2018. May we have the roll call, please. Council Member Agajanian? Present. Devine? Here. Garpetian? Here. Najarian? Here. Mayor Sinanya? Here. May we have the report, please? The agenda for the June 12, 2018 special public meeting of the City Council was posted on Friday, June 8, 2018 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. What is next on the agenda? That one would be Director of Finance regarding status update of local sales tax revenue sources, 1A motion to note and file report, B would be motion to provide, provide staff direction. Thank you, Ms. Beers. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, good afternoon. Uh, we were before you in a study session uh, a few weeks ago uh, as it relates to revenue options. Um, and this is one of the areas that we covered as it relates to uh, local sales tax revenue sources. And we said that we would come back uh, and give you an update on what the status of that is and, and what we pay out as it relates to these uh, measures and propositions and uh, what we receive in return uh, here in the city of Glendale. Um, you know, as we go through the slides, and, and Mr. Elliott will take you through the slides, I think you'll see um, really boldly that the city of Glendale ultimately pays out about $90 million annually, and uh, we receive approximately uh, $15 million back for services uh, locally. And, and that is Let's a- Say that again. Yeah. $90 million we pay out, our residents pay out- Correct. And to local and, res and uh, county Agencies, taxes. county taxes, et cetera. And we get how much of that? Uh, about $15 million, million dollars back. And it's just even hard for me to say those words and it's hard to swallow. That's one sixth, right? It yeah. is, right. yeah. It's so we get one sixth of the money that we pay into a common pot yes. back to yes, us. Sir. Yes, sir. That's not unfair, I don't know what is, but please it, <laughs> From a tax yes, board, um, I would uh, We would agree with you. Um, and, and you have a uh, very limited ability to be able to um, really have any jurisdiction over um, how those funds come back to you here for you to be able to give us that policy direction in terms of services within uh, our local community. So as part of the discussion today, we will touch on uh, kind of gauging your interest on, on a possibility of a three-fourth uh, percent sales tax. Um, if there was any sort of appetite from uh, the governing body to place something on the agenda um, in July uh, in terms of your feedback today to say yes, we're interested in looking in the possibility of maintaining um, our ability to be able to say what uh, those taxes should be utilized for. And we'll get into details. Currently we're at 9.5% in terms of sales tax here in Glendale. We have the option and the ability to increase that to 10.25%. Um, and, and that ability, that three quarter percent sales tax, those each quarter percent, uh, half percent up to three quarter percent, other agencies um, and uh, the county have the option of, of and, I, and I think of it when I used to play this game in, in the 80s and 70s as I was growing up, it reminds me of the hungry hippo uh, game, uh, honestly, because there's just this ability, this this continuous gobbling up, uh, grabbing of the monies that our constituency, our community members should have access to, um, and and not others uh, overall. And, and it just reminds me of that game because it's a continuous grab. Um, and and I'm here before you today to say I hope you consider the option and, and the possibility of placing something on on the ballot in November. No decision needs to be made today. Again, uh, it's just direction for us if there's a, a modicum of interest to come back to you in, in July um, and then ultimately by August to, to place something um, on the ballot in November. But I'll let Mr. Elliott get into some of the details um, because I guess I can get on my soapbox and continuously <laughs> talk about the importance of this and the importance of you having um, the ability again to make those policy decisions for uh, the city of Glendale versus other people. So uh, with that, Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, I am excited about doing this today. It's been a long time. Uh, we've talked about re different revenue um, options over the years that I've been here. I want to uh, uh, point out Armin Harkali and our deputy director over um, revenue and grants for doing a lot of the legwork on this. It takes me back from many years ago when I was the revenue manager in our neighboring city 
um, and, and it was kind of a refresher because a lot of these weren't around when I was doing uh, revenues and estimating things. Um, what I want to do first is, is walk you through a little bit of the basics on sales tax. Um, as you know, currently our rate is 9.5% um, collected and administered by, by the state. Uh, the agency used to be known as the State Board of Equalization. It's now the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Um, they collect it through all the businesses file their sales tax returns uh, every quarter. They distribute it all out. Um, it's not 100% direct, but we do get that 1%, and I'll walk you through how that's broken up um, and, and, and what portion we get. Um, sales tax is a general tax. It can be used for any purpose within the general fund. So the threshold is a 50% plus one in terms of voting, at least currently. Uh, special taxes um, always require a two-thirds vote. Um, and usually go for a particular purpose, whether it's a landscaping district or something to that, to that effect. So out of the 9.5%, uh, we get 1%. That equates to about $40 million a year in Glendale. If you do the math, that's about $4 billion a year in taxable sales within the city of Glendale. Um, there are, uh, right now our cap is to, uh, 10 and a quarter percent, and I'll break down that. Uh, all the different components of that in a minute. Um, the state has raised that limit for other purposes in the past, and I'll show you what those are. Um, other governments uh, we've talked about, uh, such as AQMD or, or potentially LA County, um, could consider to put another local portion of sales tax on the ballot if they so choose. We, do ha we have heard that AQMD is considering a quarter cent uh, tax for their purposes. And Whoop. this happens all the time, right? We, we just had Measure H, which was a county measure. Correct. And we had Measure M before that. Measure, yep. And these countywide tax measures are voted upon by all the, the county. Yeah, the entire the county. county. And the individual municipalities, whether they like it or not, they're, they're kind of... They're um, bound by the county Burned by it, yeah, whether yeah. they like it or not. So. And there's... Winners and losers within that. Right, win depending on the money gets divvied up. Just a, just a follow up on that. I think uh, on measures like Measure H, uh, the the cities that they're already tapped capped out, right? Capped up, uh, like they're ten and ten and a quarter, ten and a half. Uh, they're not paying into that fund, but they are getting the benefit. From they can it. benefit from it, correct? So. And I'll go through what what city those those are. I'm oh, sorry. So while we're at it. Could uh, the state legislature pass some kind of law they, that would that would ban those cities that are tapped out to, from benefiting from new uh, countywide measures? I don't know. I, I suppose they could. I would have to defer to Mike on that one. I would suspect I that generally taxation is a, is a statewide matter, so the legislature could do that. Whether they would, um, I don't know. But they could. If I mean, if enough cities sort of smarten up and tap out at, max out at uh, 10 and a quarter, then? Either that or you'd see another push to maybe increase that limit. They, right, they increase may, the, right, or right. increase the limit, And they did that perhaps. for, for uh, uh, R and, and uh, Okay. So, again, out of the 2% uh, allotment that's set aside for local use, um, uh, currently the uh, major H applies against that as does um, Prop So let, let me stop you for, for one second. I'm confused about the local, the expression local use because uh, second bullet point states <coughs> current 9.5% sales tax can be increased to 10 and a quarter for local use. And then it says limit of 2% for local use. So is it 10, 10 and a quarter for local use or is it 2% for local the, use? The, the upper ceiling is 10 and a quarter. Of that 10 and a quarter, there's a 2% allotment for right. local use. So that local use that's up there so, is kind of confusing, I'm saying. Current 9.5% so sales tax can be increased to 10 and a quarter for local use. Up to 10 and a quarter. So, so oh, I get it, but not, it's not for all for local use, and most of it is not for local use. Correct. So the 10 and a quarter, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so the 10 and a quarter is the, the taxation, the, the sales tax rate that's applied upon the goods but right. the 2% is what actually gets returned. I just wanted yeah. to clarify, I wanted to make sure that was the case. Yeah, so out of, out of the 2% local use thus far, 
there's 1% each half, half cent for Prop A and Prop C for transportation uh, measures, and then Major H applies against that uh, for the homeless services. That, so that, why are those considered local use? I honestly don't know. I think that's it's, just It's a, a good question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's, it's clearly, as Measure H has demonstrated amply, is not local use. Because we're being, not using it local locally in county countywide. For countywide, countywide purposes. And an allotment based on uh, necessity, depending on um, what that breakdown is and how that um, particular measure is written. But okay, that's yes. Talk about a misnomer. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at this stack chart, maybe visually it would help. Um, this is the as it is today. This is the nine and a half percent sales tax. Um, seven and a quarter is the state portion of which we get our one percent general tax for the general fund currently. Uh, uh, above that, we have Measure R and Measure M. Those were not included in the local cap. The state got, or the county got ex uh, an exemption from the state to, lo to raise the, the uh, total, but not apply that to the cap. So we have currently Prop A, Prop C, and Measure H are applied into that local 2% cap, allowing uh, leaving uh, 0.75 left for further use by whatever taxing agency gets voted in. Mm -hmm. So just uh, uh, to be uh, very clear, there's two types of tax um, distribution that we get. Local return is that per cap. Yes. Do you remember, because I knew once, uh, when these uh, measures are expiring? M R A C M R doesn't expire. Yeah, it's, uh, there's uh, there's one that does exp uh, in twenty. Well, we'll get to it. We're in, we'll, All right. we'll get to cover it. it down. Um, there's no uh, uh, major uh, prop A and prop C have been in, in place quite quite some time and. Uh, each um, R has an expiration. Oh. Yeah, but yes. R gets and consumed. But then the other one goes up. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go over that. Continue. Yeah, it's evergreen. So local return is the amount of the tax that's generated on, on all these five different taxes that we get a, a uh, per capita amount that's distributed through the county. Um, so our pro rata share of uh, population within the county um, it is then we get that portion of the tax uh, uh, that's allocated for local return. A sub-regional return is project-based. Right. So if there's a transportation project or something else, um, the uh, specific, um, you know, if it's Metro or whomever uh, decides where those project dollars go, and we do, we do receive some of those. And local return is different from local use by definition. Lo local return is our local, our, our portion. Right. It's just a matter. Of, it's yeah. a, it's explaining what our portion. So is. graphically, this is um, this is uh, our estimates for 1819 for for Prop A and C measure R, M, and H. So the blue is what we generate um, based off our regular sales tax that we get um, in that one percent. So each one of these is a half half percent. They generate approximately 20 million. The uh, measure H is a quarter percent, which ge generates approximately 10 million. And these are our estimates in terms of what we would receive um, allocated on the uh, local return portion for the city of Glendale. So again, that's 15 million coming back uh, of, of the 90 million that we generate for the local return. That's about 13.3%. Uh, add in the 3.4 3 for the sub-regional projects, we get about 16.7 or one-sixth of the money generated in Glendale back to Glendale for those various uses. Um, so I want to do a little bit um, uh, deeper dive, and I wanted to show you first on, again, this is all of it and all-inclusive of what they look like adding in these um, uh, sub-regional return amounts, that's shown in the, the purple or darker blue um, that we get on Prop A and Measure R, and those again are project-based, and that's what gets us to that f total $15 million. So all in, this is what, what it looks like, what we generate versus what we produce. So looking at Prop A specific, um, it was passed by LA, voter, LA County voters in 1980. Of that tax, 
uh, to only 25% of that tax, not be confused as the, the 50 per, uh, 0.5% rate that's generated, uh, of the 100% tax, we only get a quarter is designated through local return on your pro rata uh, population of the county. The other 75% is designated for projects, um, discretionary or rail. Um, some, of the, some of the monies we've gotten over the time um, for sub-regional type are, are um, more of the maintenance and, and uh, uh, items that we have for the B-line, fare box, um, uh, replacement, some other uh, uh, reduction, community reduction programs, uh, along with the operations of, of our uh, bus system. Prop A brings in 20 million a year. Correct. The county, and we get 3.8 million. We get very little. And so here, looking at Prop A, here's a five-year history uh, going, then here's 16, 17. Uh, we haven't finished, obviously, 17, 18 yet, so we don't have all the money in, but this is our, our five-year history of what's been generated within the city of Glendale. And uh, this is the uh, yellow is the uh, local return amount, and then the purple again is the sub-regional allocations that we have received for Prop A over the last five years. So the, the local return aspect of this, I mean, even, even though Glendale is, what, third or fourth largest in the county, it sounds like, per definition, LA and Long Beach get lion's share of local return. Based off the population, yeah, that's per capita. That's, so that's they, a per capita right, distribution. Right. So we get our portion of the total co county population, and that's only they took take a quarter, 25 percent of the tax generated, and then distribute it on a headcount. Everything else goes into projects. So we do get some project money, the subregional allocation. Um, we we're fairly consistent in about you know 3.2 back in 12-13. Uh, in seven, or 16, 17, we got 3.6. So it's steadily uh, going up, but um, you can see as is the amount that we generate on an annual basis. Uh, Similarly, question. oh, yes. Got the question. Um, going back to, going back to this slide, it says $90 million we generate, and the estimate is, I'm looking at slide six. Mm -hmm. Estimate is we get 15 million back, Correct. That's, that's for 18-19 uh, uh, fiscal year. That's, that's what our estimates are for 18-19. Yeah, because I'm adding it up. It doesn't add up to 15. It adds up to 13. That, that's 14-15. These are for, this is different the, years. The, um, slide 6. So if you, six. well, the, if you look at all the total on slide 8, that, that gets you up to the 15 million. And that's this. The, that includes the sub-regional plus the um, uh, local allocation. Okay. Yeah, the sub yeah sub-regional was not included in that. Slide. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank you. Uh, Prop C was passed in 1990. Um, again, it's another half cent sales tax. Uh, Unlike Prop A, that they take 25% of the tax, this one takes 20% of the tax generated and allocates it on a per capita amount. And the remainder goes into a sub-regional allocation for construction um, and other transit-related items. Um, the money we receive, we use for B-line maintenance and operations, uh, Glendale Transportation Center, so on and so forth. And we have been uh, fairly successful in getting project money in that respect. Five-year history on Prop C, again, this is the same generation, at the half cent uh, sales tax, and these are the amounts that we've received on the local return um, over the years. Measure R was passed in 2008, um, and we steadily go down in terms of the amount that's allocated on a per capita basis. This one, we, uh, they take the, the total tax and divide only 15% of the tax up on a local return or per capita amount, and the 85% goes into transit, um, new rail, rap, uh, bus rapid transit, and, and things like that. So um, some of the projects that we have um, for this money include the uh, river, fall, uh, river walk uh, bridge, 
Grandview, Sonora Railroad Crossing, the uh, State Route 134 uh, interchange. So there, there is a, a fair amount that's generated. Again, though, it's disproportionate of what um, Glendale puts into the system. So over, uh, I get mixed up here, let me measure. That measure R, okay. And going to measure M, that's our most recent one that was passed in 2016. Again, uh, uh, it will increase to 1% in 2039. 16% um, of that tax is allocated on a per capita amount, and the remainder is divided up through um, various projects, um, and, and some of these have uh, been utilized for transit routes and mobility planning and, and uh, other transit-related items like that. Yes, sir. This uh, in 2039. So if you we raise the tax to 10 and quarter percent, then this one percent or half a percent more will bring the tax to something like 10.75 percent. And that's at the expense of Measure R, isn't it? R gets I believe so. Doesn't R, R goes away? Yes. R goes away, and, and the half a percent for R becomes part of M. So over the two-year history uh, for Measure M, this is what we've generated um, and versus what we received very little in return for, for really what's been generated over the last two years. And the last one uh, to take a look at is Measure H, um, very new, passed it in 2017, another quarter cent tax. Um, this one, however, is allocated based off the homeless population um, within LA County. So again, out of the 10 million generated, uh, we've received um, 140,000 uh, the first year and about 280,000 the second year. Very disproportionate um, amongst these different uh, measures. So again, um, when you look at the total amount, um, if we were to increase the nine and a half to ten and three quarter or ten and a quarter, um, that is the allowance uh, allowed for local use. Um, so again, on a stack chart, what that would look, look like is we take that upper blue portion available, that 0.75 for the city of Glendale, we'd max out in terms of, of the total tax uh, uh, allowed by the state at this point in time. Um, our neighbors to both sides of this, both Burbank and Pasadena, are um, in the same process. Uh, Pasadena has been uh, at the pro uh, doing outreach meetings for quite some time and plan to take this to their council in July, as does Burbank, um, four three quarters of a cent. Other cities that already have uh, local tax measures in place, they're listed here, there's 15 of them. Um, I handed out a, um, another sheet that we just got yesterday for the um, ones that have been passed. One is in April for the city's uh, El Segundo, that was three quarter cent. Um, and other ones passed throughout the state um, just last week. Um, the majority of them passed, uh, including Huntington Park, um, Chula Vista down south, Grass Valley, um, some as high as 1%. Um, what we highlighted here, the ones that are starred are ones that are already at their max, um, so they do not contribute to the Measure H. Um, Long Beach of note, as, as is Santa Monica, so they still get uh, uh, distributions for Major H um, based off homeless count, but their, their citizens, are, their, their tax is not get, being put into that pot. So again, that three-quarter cent sales tax in, in uh, Glendale would generate $30 million to be used by um, the city for its own purposes. Uh, visually, we put that on the chart relative to the others um, to see that we would basically get full benefit of that $30 million uh, for what's generated here versus the other taxes and the, and the small amount that has been allocated. So we would not have to split or take would a not. percentage or any of that? That $30 million would be completely in the city's general fund? So the other, the other way to look at it and, uh, is if you <laughs> stack all those together, the 90 million that's generated, and this is what we get on all measures if you add it together, 
um, against the 30 million that we could uh, keep right here in our own uh, town and spend it how directed by city council. So one threat to this whole idea is the the um, the uh, uh, law that's being circulated now to be put on the on the ballot, uh, the Tax Fairness, Transparency, and Account Accountability Act that <coughs> was brought to you. Christine Powers did a presentation on May 8th, and Council uh, passed a resolution opposing this act. Um, honestly, this would be incredibly destructive to uh, cities throughout the state. Um, it would raise the threshold for any tax to two-thirds um, passage versus the, the simple majority of 50 plus one. Um, which would be very difficult to do. So some of the measures that passed in the past uh, may not pass now if, if you have to have a two-thirds threshold um, to uh, have, have it successful. Um, one of the real uh, interesting items on this would be it be retroactive back to the beginning of 2018. And I, I, that just, I, I've never seen anything that's retroactive back to the beginning. Um, when I'm not sure how that would um, ultimately pan out in terms of uh, having it um, decided in the courts. This uh, measure is, is sponsored by the American Beverage Association. I guess they're upset about the recycling and some of the fees for plastic um, throughout the state. It's also backed by big oil and insurance companies, um, and I'm not sure 100% why, but th this is they're putting millions of dollars into this um, ballot initiative. Um, the League of California Cities has opposed it, and they're working with um, other agencies um, to try and uh, get this um, defeated. So there is some risk if we do even try to um, put this forth. So next steps, as we've discussed, um, the uh, November uh, election, uh, November 6th, uh, we have to have um, notice by August 10th to be able to put something on the November ballot, which means we would likely come back to you um, July 10th, depending on your direction. Again, $30 million is, is, is at stake for local Glendale use. And with that, we'll take questions. Questions? On the issue of raising the tax three quarter of percent, I want to make sure that we will specifically will say what we're going to use it for. Well, because, as you mentioned, if yeah. we make it the entire money specifically what we're going to use it for, then we need two third vote of the public, right? Correct. But if we make it like for few program, then what we need two third vote or. If, if 50% there, plus uh, one. Mr. Mayor, members of council, if there's any designation of that that tax revenue for specific purposes, whether it's one or 20, it, it would become a special tax. Uh, you can, for example, note that it's for general fund purposes and it will be used for things like police and fire and parks and libraries, but you cannot, de you cannot specifically limit it uh, without turning it into a special tax. So mm -hmm. I would imagine if, if the council were to put this on the ballot, um, and uh, you see this in ballot measures across the state when a, a general purpose tax such as a sales tax is put on the ballot. It is, des it is noted in the, in the ballot measure that it will be used for general fund purposes for such things like, but it doesn't specifically restrict it to those uses because that turns it into a, a special tax requiring that two-thirds vote. Because, um, excuse me, because I want to make sure that we have uh, somehow to be specific what we're going to do with this money. I mean, just to raise the tax on public and say, okay, this is better because government will come and take that 75% away from us, does not help the general public. We have to be specific. We have time because we don't have to decide today. I, I want to ask that uh, I, maybe city council or I, city attorney or whoever to study this issue because I want to make sure that specifically we know what we're going to use it for. If we make it like another general tax levy, then this going to go away and I don't see the public really going to benefit from it. I want to make sure such as that we'll say we've used 15 million of it per year for affordable housing or this specific purpose, not to have more money and then 
everybody will come say, okay, my salary is low, I have one higher salary, or I want to use it for other purposes. So we have to be specific what we're going to use it for. How you have to word it, uh, I leave it to our uh, and fearless and again, and again, city I attorney to, to consider that. And again, depending on, on the direction we receive from, from council, um, if it is very specific uh, as it relates to what council member Agajanian is, is uh, seeking, uh, it would be a special tax and you would need a, a super majority, you would need a two thirds uh, approval rate for that to move forward. And you can do that if that's what the council um, directs us to do. Um, our uh, recommendation to you would be, uh, if you were to, again, go down this path uh, and place such, such an item on, on the ballot um, to have language there uh, with the educational pieces that will go along with it to talk about the types of things overall that um, $30 million can be used for. So it would be more general and it wouldn't be specific um, and it would be inclusive of services within and we would list uh, each of the departments and what those services are. But again, uh, depending on council direction, uh, we can go uh, with that any way you, you prefer. Anyone? Yes, yes I. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think uh, I want to get the report back so we understand what it is and we, we can discuss different options that we have at that time, including the options that Mr. Councilmember Agajani was indicating. And also, uh, I think the option over there that every year, uh, the council will have a choice of how to spend that money. Maybe one year spend half of it on affordable housing, the other half on parks next year. $30 million is a lot of money. It's, it's about 15% of our uh, general budget. Uh, so I think that has to be there. When we come back with this study, it will be in council's discretion as to how to spend that money for next year. $30 million is a lot of money. Maybe you say $10 million, put it aside. For a rainy day, don't spend it. You don't have to spend every penny of that 30 million every year. So I think council will have that leverage as to uh, what to do with those funds if that is doable. I don't know if that's, that can be done part of that, uh, you know, the, the ballot measure or what have you. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that last part. What, what do you mean? You want a the special tax or you want the general Not tax? a special tax. It's, it's a general tax, but every year council will, well, will we decide. We approve the budget every year anyway. Right. I mean, we decide how we spend process. all the money anyway. No, because the way it's being explained is it will be only for what's in the general budget today, which is police, fire, no. Uh, no, 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 parks, no. And, and libraries. No. And I think that's the thing that Mr. Arjan is indicating, that that money can be spent on other issues as well. You can spend on anything that you can spend general fund monies on. What which can we spend general monies on? host of things including all the things that you've mentioned yeah are we direction. limited are we limited to spending general funds money on salaries and pension no no okay there we go no. does that make it make more sense i think uh, I, well, it makes it more difficult <laughs> well because we know again, that it be, the, we know right. that we can we can spend the general fund on salaries and uh pensions or what have you but we wanted to know what else can can this fund be spent on and that is including uh Maybe you want to do. You want to spend some of it to do the study for a streetcar project, for example. Can we do that or not? Absolutely. Yes, you absolutely yeah. can. That's, that's what I'm saying. Our hands are open. Your to, hands are not tied. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. If it is a general uh, tax, your hands are not tied. And and as you all know, on an annual basis, you are the the um, individuals, the board of directors, that tells us yes or no on budgetary decisions. And so you would be able to make a decision. Um, as it relates to what that funding uh, would be utilized for. And you can set a work plan in place um, where you would say um, for the next five years even, this is what we anticipate doing um, and these are the expenditures that we would like to see and break it down in a, in a whole host of different ways. Um, but that is completely up, up to the city council, um, especially when it's a general tax. Um, your hands are not tied and you can utilize it on a whole host of, of different items. I, you know, not, not to minimize council member uh, Ajanyan's concern, I think it's a very legitimate concern. It's human tendency when there is money available to be in a rush to spend it. And, you know, we, we do 
come across the issue of salaries once in a while. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not an unfounded concern, but at the end of the day, that's what the council is for. We're here to make responsible decisions for the whole city and having that money available um, every year when, we, when we're dealing with the budget, we have to exercise restraint and make sure that we spend it uh, responsibly. I hope we do that every year with or without this $30 million. But I'll tell you that making sure that any monies that are being levied on our residents is in some way at least benefiting the residents of this city is good enough purpose for me. That in of itself is a, is a, is a valuable tool. Otherwise, we're um, completely giving up our, our, our right to use our own residents' monies. And, and I mean, this, you're looking at Measure H, that chart is, is atrocious. It's criminal. Well, how, I mean, how can this be? How can there be any justice in that? But we're, you know, potentially looking at multiple Measure H, H's until we tap out at 10 and, 10 and a quarter. And all of that money, you know, whatever, we're getting 14 cents on $10. I mean, that's absurd. So do, we, do you have instructions? I think we have clear direction to bring something back. Well, yes. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, looking at these figures is, is shocking. It's like um, uh, we've been burned, and it's, it's like we're just sitting here waiting for the, the left shoe to drop where someone's going to come in the county, the state's going to come in and, and levy another tax on our citizens, and then we get nothing. And I, um, I think that's completely unfair. I, I'm not one to say, let's tax everybody again. I, I would never do that unless it's for a very good reason. And it seems to me that doing this before someone else gets the opportunity to do it to us uh, is, is, a, uh, is a good argument uh, for, uh, for uh, this, uh, tax, this tax levy. So um, I would I, be I, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. When uh, uh, our finance director started the presentation said, oh, I'm very excited to bring this to you. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, I'm not. Because, yeah, and I think our, no, I can't imagine any, any of our colleagues being excited about the prospect of uh, raising taxes on our residents. But it seems like our hand is being forced here. If we don't do it, someone's going to do it. And guess what? We're not going to get any of, any of that benefit. Or maybe we're going to get 14 cents on $10. Yeah, that's what and, and Glendale has been such a recipient of being conservative Right. and not wanting to levy those taxes on its residents. Prop 13 is a very good example of that. Um, and that historical kind of, um, of decision making, which, which has been you know, very good for this community, um, sometimes you know, has, has been counter based on the fact that these other agencies have access uh, to the funding that you um, as the council should really have the ability to make a decision on versus others for this community. And, and the, another thing that really um, uh, influences me to, to, to go ahead with this is the fact when you look at these cities um, that are already at the cap and they are getting money, uh, like Long Beach, a lot of money from Measure H that we're, we're giving them. And if we were at that cap, we would still be getting you know, since we pat, you know, whether we pass or not, since we would still be getting that extra money. Not a lot, but and, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but know, still, it's, uh, you know, I, I, it just is uh, kind of uh, aggravating yeah. and frustrating to see what's happening to the money that our residents are putting into these measures. We're, I mean, we're not, it's not like we're not team players. We're not concerned right. for the overall uh, geographic or sort of, political area that we live on, yes, we are. We're willing to sort of do our part to contribute our share of it. But this inequity in the way we're being taxed is just too much. It's too much. It's unfair. Yes, Mr. Nigerian. So I just want to a lot of it has been said, um, but I'm, I'm against additional taxes. Uh, but that position uh, is meaningless if the county or another governmental agency through a vote can impose a tax on Glendale. Um, so I do think we need to uh, go forward and if, and it will, it will happen. There will be one additional regional or uh, uh, other governmental tax that will come along. Uh, I think we have a duty to our residents to make sure that 
in the event that there's taxes, which, which they would vote on, that those taxes remain in the city, I think we should, I think a, a solution to this is to uh, create a fund and not just dump it into the general fund because things get lost in the general fund. Just have an earmarked account. Uh, so each year as we do our budget, we'll have a discussion on the sum of money uh, that we have taxed our residents on. Um, and, and you're right, the, it was, it's bad that we're getting 14 cents on every, uh, every dollar, every $10 that we're paying in. But what's even more criminal are cities like Santa Monica, Long Beach in particular with the homeless issue that have such huge needs and demands that, uh, you know, no wonder they voted for it, right? That's almost, uh, that's almost an unfair vote. You know, vote for taxes on everyone else except your city because you're maxed out. And by the way, due to your uh, failure to dedicate other sources towards your homeless issues, you're gonna be receiving uh, the lion's share of the proceeds. So uh, I'm fully in favor of going forward and exploring this issue and uh, hopefully our residents will understand that uh, the motivations and the intent uh, of, of our actions and our discussions today. And I think uh, if and when this comes in front of us and in front of us and in front of uh, staff, you know, we, we <coughs> need to explain to our residents this sort of the technical aspect of this, that it, you know, if, it, if we don't do it, someone else is gonna do it and we're not gonna get any of it. Um, that needs to be conveyed to our residents so that they understand that we abhor the idea of additional taxes, but it's just a matter of uh, taxes for us or taxes that we pay and not and we don't benefit from. Mr. Agajemi. I just uh, want to add that uh, I'm against raising the taxes, but I want to make sure this whatever we collect at least to have a separate account. Where this tax gonna go in that account? Not, maybe you call it general account or whatever the name is. But the tax to go to that account and we know where we are spending. Not with the general account, then we have $260 million and we start spending that. No, this if we are collecting the tax should be separated from the rest of the whatever we have in our account. So to be very specific where it goes and everybody will know they are paying more taxes. Already people, they have lots of problems by staying in Glendale. That's why some they are leaving. The rent is high. Now we are raising the tax on them and we can't help them much because as far as I know, Burbank, which is a smaller city than Glendale, has more affordable housing units than Glendale. I mean, this is half size of Glendale. So we have to come up somehow to help people, not just raise the taxes and then add to our general account. Let's we have to have a separate yeah, account for this. If I may add, um, there is no problem at all. We can do special accounting. We can bring it forth uh, each year in the budget um, as, as that pot of, uh, revenue raised. I do believe, though, if it's a general tax, it has to go into the general fund. Can there be a um, sub we can fund certainly within the general for fund? It separately. Yeah, we'll you can program it separately. It separately. So it'll be, yeah, council we will be can, making that decision separately on right. what's going to happen so with that money. For you sure. can put $30 million and just have it flow through the general fund and put it into capital improvements. You could use, you know, uh, amounts for uh, homeless needs or whatever council decides. But if it's a general tax, it has to go into the general fund first. But again, we can account for it and track it um, to look, you know, to down to the down to the cent. So um, I, I don't want that to, you know, be any sort of hurdle that, that it can be done easily. Okay, so it's, it goes into general fund, but it's accounted for separately or- Yeah, we just set up a new account a for it. Uh, exactly. You know, we can report on it separately and you can program it separately. Very well. Anything else on this item? Is this a- well, Red staff. Yes. Well, I yeah. think we have a yeah, good direction. Um, is there a motion on this? There was motion directing staff, but I think right. we have. So you had no cards. Can make we that have no movement. cards. Okay. okay. So, so there is motion. a motion. Yeah. Do we have a, a motion from someone? Right. Do 
we have so a, moved. So moved. We have a second. second. The, May we have the roll call, please? Councilmember Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpetian? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Next item, please. Two would be Director of Community Development regarding petition phase for the expansion and renewal of Greater Downtown Glendale Community Benefit District. 2A, motion to note and file the Greater Downtown Glendale Community Benefit District petition results. B, resolution of intention to establish the Greater Downtown Glendale Community Benefit District of 2018 and to levy and collect assessments within such districts formed under Ordinance 5771 of the Glendale Municipal Code and resolution number 12-117 relating to the establishment of the Community Benefit District and appointing a time and place for the hearing objections, objections here too. C would be motion authorizing the city manager to sign the ballots for city owned property in support of the Community Benefit District. Mr. Mayor, members uh, of the City Council, I will go directly to Jennifer Hiramoto, uh, Principal Economic Development uh, Manager, Hi, who will take you through the report. Great. Good afternoon, Mr. Afternoon. Mayor, members of Council. Uh, you just received the presentation that will be seen today and also um, up-to-date information on the petition summary as well as petitions. This has been a process that just concluded on July 11th. Uh, at the time of the staff report, some of the petition information was still being collected, uh, which is why you have this new info. Um, so at this time, uh, we are going to be considering the expansion and renewal of the downtown central business district. Uh, and there are some administrative items related to that. And later, we'll also be asking you to consider uh, whether you would like to authorize uh, the city manager as a designee for the vote. Um, in the audience today, we also have Rick Lemo, president of the Downtown Glendale Association, and Marco Lamandri, executive director of New City America. Uh, this is the consultant hired to explore and implement the renewal. Marco has led the formation of districts across the country, so he's very knowledgeable uh, in the formation process, and I encourage you to ask him any questions regarding the formation. Uh, and of course, you know Mr. Rick Lemo uh, as DGA president, and he's available to answer any questions as well. Uh, just a little bit of background. So the, the downtown central business district was formed back in, in 2012. And if you recall, this was right after redevelopment was concluded and the community was still looking for different financing alternatives to provide the community with services without some of that funding. Um, the term ends in December 31st, 2019. There's really three main goals of the, of the uh, central business district. It's to attract new customers, increase sales, and increase occupancies. Uh, the Downtown Glendale Association is the nonprofit hired to implement these tactics, and really they have two, two areas of focus that they look at, marketing and then sidewalk operations and beautification. Through the, I have a photo up here of the ambassadors. You've seen them in downtown. That's one of the elements. Uh, we have other elements of beautification, up here you have a photo of some of the umbrellas that are on the Maryland Paseo, for example, and throughout the district. That's part of what the DGA does with the funding. Uh, we also have other fall displays. This is, again, part of the beautification efforts, um, elements of the holiday decor, and um, some of the spring flowers. It's part of the district identity. Marketing is a component of this as well. So DGA has hired a marketing firm, uh, Mustang Marketing, and they continue to look at ways in which they can bring attention and awareness to downtown Glendale. Currently, the district extends about eight blocks from Sanchez to Colorado, and generally on, uh, on brand, it does include some of Maryland, um, as well as it extends to portions of the Glendale Galleria as well. Uh, and it also includes on the east side of, of Orange. When considering the future of the district, uh, and as I mentioned, the term ends December 31st, 2019, the DGA board was asked, to, um, was asked to explore whether this is the right time to talk about renewing and expanding the district. There were a few reasons for that. Uh, one was that the, the district, in considering the, the number of uh, residents and the influx of downtown um, units that have been added, 
they would like to be able to continue the services to those areas as well. Um, and in fact, some of the businesses, or, excuse me, property owners, especially north of the 134, have actually reached out to the Downtown Glendale Association to see whether that would be an opportunity for them. Um, also, in anticipation in some of the changing market conditions, it was decided that this may be the most opportune time to have this discussion. Um, in, in moving forward with the expansion of a district, uh, you would follow the same steps as we went through back in 2012. And again, Marco is available to describe these steps. Um, back in October 2017, the DGA board authorized the, um, the uh, steering committee to explore the expansion and to consider terminate, terminating early. Over the past few months, there has been outreach efforts to property owners to gauge their interest on this. And on June 1st, petitions were mailed out to property owners. Uh, on June 11th, the petition process concluded, so that was yesterday. 30% of the votes were, were needed, um, and in total, we ended up, uh, the DGA ended up receiving 32.85% of the votes, which is enough to move forward with the next process. Uh, part of that process is why you're here today. Uh, according to the California State and Highways Code, the next step would be to have a public hearing, uh, which is what we're doing now, asking for an adoption of uh, resolution of intention by the city council. And if approved, that would trigger a 45-day uh, balloting process and a public hearing would conclude on July 1st, excuse me, 31st, uh, where we would need 50% plus one of the ballots returned um, need to be in support. Um, just as far as the district, uh, there's uh, th there will be two slides, um, so I'll just question, break this up. A question. Yes, sir. You said balloting process. Can you explain that one more time? How does that work? Yes. Or to expand the, the district? Is that what it's for? Exactly. So all of the <coughs> property owners that are in this new proposed district will be, uh, they were all sent a petition. <coughs> um, and those petitions then were received, which is what's before you. From, uh, if the council were to adopt this resolution of intention, then there are ballots that will be mailed to the property owners within the district. Um, the entire district or just the, uh, the portion that's going to The entire to district. The entire district, okay. And at that time, then, they have the 45 days in which to vote. And on July 31st, the ballots will actually be opened up in front of you um, during the council meeting. So uh, this is one portion of the proposed district. Uh, I mentioned before we have about eight blocks currently in the district. The proposed district is, uh, will um, have 35 square blocks. And this is from the 134 south to Colorado, which remains the same. But one of the differences is that they will be expanding um, to include this section on east, excuse me, on west of Orange to Central, and generally it's on the east side of Central. It will go up and it will carve out to include some of the new developments um, north of the 134 freeway. And north of the freeway, um, all of this would be a new district, uh, or not new district, but all of this would be new areas that would be part of the, the greater downtown Glendale district. Um, you'll see that I've highlighted some areas here. This is just to indicate that there are a total of 12 properties that the city of Glendale will add. Um, in total, there's 43 properties that the city will have within this district if proposed. Um, a lot of these parcels are their easements and very, very small properties. Um, and in total, it will end up being about an additional $13,000 in assessments each year. Sorry, I have a list over here, uh, petition report. Yes, sir. Is this all the property owners in the, in the current district? The, the petition summary you have before you is just the, the folks that have submitted supportive ballots, uh, or excuse me, supportive uh, petitions. So that represents the 32.85%. Um, the, the complete list is included in the district management plan. And um, so that 32 percent that it's needed to expand the, the, the district, these are the, the members of the district that submitted support letters to expand? 
the rest didn't support it, uh, they didn't submit anything? That's almost correct. So those are the 32% that is needed to, uh, to move forward then with the vote. Um, so at that time then, um, the, so you are correct in that the remaining folks, the some 67% did not um, issue a supportive ballot or did not return a ballot at all. Joanne? A I'm petition. Sorry, yes, me. it's a petition. So there was no response. What we what you have in front of you are the petitions that were in support of requesting that you adopt a resolution of intention to move forward with the process where balloting would take place. Um, and if there is not um, support from 50% plus one for the formation of the district, it would fail. And the existing district would continue its life through its additional two years. So but 32% uh, that responded to the petition are here in this four page. That's, that's correct. That's what Jennifer was referring to, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir Virginia? Yeah. Um, so nobody mailed a letter saying I'm against, <coughs> I take it. Uh, I will defer that question over to Marco um, Lamandri if he's available. Marco? Thank you, City Council people. Um, just to clarify, the petition drive went out on June 1st and now it's June 12th that I've, I'm doing two districts right now. As Jennifer had stated, I formed districts, but I've also managed this district since 2012. You've received 32% in 12 days. Two districts I'm doing right now took three years to get to that point. So there's a, a, there's a lot of support for it. Um, Councilman, you had mentioned the people that didn't respond. Well, if we would have extended the district by, or the petition gathering process by another month, we probably would have easily reached 40 to 50%. The odds are in doing this, and I've done this 78 times, that um, about 50 to 65% of the property owners actually return their ballots. So that's why we use the figure of 30%. That's about one half of the people that will wind up returning their ballots. And I can answer any other technical questions that you have regarding uh, this process. I just have a, a comment out of that 32%, which is four pages, three and, three and a half pages, uh, one, two, almost two and a half pages are uh, either the city or it's Americana. That's Ameri why I was asking the question about people responding to the, to, to the petition I don't know how many of, how many properties are here, but when I look at it, a page and a half is the city, and the other page is the Americana. So you're uh, correct. And when we did the district in 2012, I was hired in March 2012, and we formed a district in four months. The people that were leading that effort were General Growth and the Galleria, the Americana, Raul Porto, who's not a huge property owner, but was part of this whole process, Joe Stidick and others. So there's always been a high concentration of weight in this district. Actually, what we're doing by expanding the district is reducing the weight of the Americana and the Galleria. Because now their assessments stay the same, but instead of a $935,000 budget, it's a 1.461 budget. Yeah. No, but no, that's I'm just the nature of what, the way your downtown is. No, I understand. I'm not disputing that. What I'm, uh, what I'm saying, I know there's always leaders and, and pioneers exactly. that they start. Right. They start a process, of course. We all know that they started, Americana started with, along with Raul Portos and the city and, and Galleria, they started this process, of course. Now right. I was just asking about the- You're correct. The 32% when you said in 10 days we got it, it's because 80% of that 32% is either the city or the Americana, that's what I'm trying to. It's, it's substantially weighted to those property owners, that's correct, okay. and that's the way it was in 2012 too. Right. Okay, thank you. I think that's it for, for now. Um, if uh, I can, can ask one question. Go ahead. Just, just sure. really Go ahead. Sure. No, no, I'm, I want to ask Jennifer. Jennifer. So the, the petitioners or the prospective petitioners, those that, whether they responded or not, are from the existing uh, district or are they, are we asking for the businesses that are in the expanded portion of the district to actually show interest to join the district? It's both of those. So it would be the proposed districts, so those in the expanded area, but it also includes those that are in the current so, district as well. 
Okay. So why do we do that? Are, you, do, are we kind of asking the existing members whether they want new members, and then we're asking the new members whether they want to become part of the old uh, group? Is that what's going on? No. I'm trying it, to understand the logic behind it because, you, you, you know, I, I assume the way this district was initially formed was through sort of interest by certain entities within that geographic area to form a, a business district, right? Right. And then as, you wanna, as you're expanding, uh, there must be interest by these people that, that are being expanded, whose area you're being expanding into, uh, to join the district, correct? That so you'd correct. think that you'd, you'd ask them or, or they would show the interest first, right? I mean, they show interest, then we say, the district says, oh, okay, these people are interested. Let's see how many of them are actually interested. And then once you have the numbers, you think, okay, let's expand or not expand. Is that, is that what happened? I'm, I'm trying to understand the dynamic behind it. Is, I don't know if Mr. Lemo, I think, is eager to answer. <laughs> Let me see if I can take it a different way. Um, think of this as a brand new formation. Okay. So you have the existing area. There is some interest expressed to both expand and include us in. Yep. So think of this as a new, um, a new formation. Okay. You want to ask everybody that's going to be in that proposed new district. And there's a distinction between the petitions and the ballots. The petitions are kind of, do you want to put this to a vote? It's more like, let's call for the question. If 30%, and, and Mr. Garpetian had pointed out, um, that is a large number, but that can't form the district, that only calls the question. Now ballots go out to everybody in that district and you ask to vote, and that's really where the outcome. I have a question on that, a follow-up question. When you say everybody, you mean the property owners, right? Uh, not, yes. the, not the business owners, because uh, there's a big difference. Very good distinction, district. Mr. Garpetian. This is a property owner-based um, district. Okay, and the property owners, they have a, a vote based on what? Based on the number of parcels that are in their it, properties, it's, it's, or number of parcels that they own, or is based on Square footage, or square footage, or it, it's based on size of lot, and I'm I am going to ask Mr. Lamandry to explain that to you because there's I like there's to different know that. levels. The California State Constitution under Prop 218 says that property assessment districts can be established by a weighted vote of property owners. So we come up with a formula, and the formula is based upon linear frontage, lot size, and building square footage. And you take all those factors, you put them together, and that assigns a weight to a property owner. So what you have before you is the weight at 33% of the weight of the district has signed a petition okay. in order to trigger the balloting. The balloting process is exactly the same. It's the weighted return ballots determine whether or not the district is formed or not. Okay, so the, the properties that are being included in the new district to the east of, uh, to the west of, Central Avenue or to the west of downtown or Brand Boulevard, which is Central Avenue. Uh, let's say one of these new developments, uh, if that one of the developments is subdivided into 100 units, do that property owner, because there are 100, 100 parcels in there, right? Because it's no, subdivided. No, those are apartments. None of those are condos. So there's no, no, one I'm, parcel. No, I understand that. I'm, I'm asking if the one of them is subdivided and they're not. Uh, one parcel, which is an apartment building, of 100 unit apartment building, but if it's a condominium project, but they're not sold, they're all leased out, that property owner will have 100, 100 votes, or how, how would that work? Well, none of those are condos at this point. None of them have been parceled. If they were parceled, though, and there was still one owner, that one owner would vote on the basis of all those condos, but that's not the case. There are no residential condos in the proposed district at this point. No, I understand that. I'm just asking if they were one. If they were, then each parcel right. would have a, a weighted vote within that district, correct? So if the owner keeps all the units and rents them out, and there are 100 units condominium with separate APN numbers, the they owner would, will have They vote 100, 100 times. Okay. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. And to get back to the previous question, I think you asked Mr. Mayor, is we were approached by Bob Stevenson, who owns a number of properties. He came to Rick and I and Joe Stidick a, a year and a half ago and said, What's going on down there, I want to happen up here. <coughs> so it was based upon Bob and CBRE has recently purchased 801 North Brand. They were also extremely interested. Nestle's moved out of the large building and we've been working with that property owner too. So we had interest from the north 
and no one ever anticipated the huge residential growth to the west mm -hmm. when we first formed the district. And so what we're trying to do is, is reboot the district, as Mr. Lanzafame was saying, and say this is an entirely new district, and that's what we wanted to move forward on. Okay, that makes sense. And then it, the whole thing got treated as an entirely new district. It's so entirely new district, asked, exactly. It. Thank you. Yeah, I know North Grand, uh, the property is north of Glen Oaks. I know the property owners over there are interested to join the, the downtown. Downtown Glendale Association. What was it? The Mer Downtown's Merchants Association before? Is that what it was? Okay. Ms. Devine, do you have something? I, to I was just interested in how the voting was going, but I think you you um, explained that uh, previously. Um, I just think it's a good idea that that this that other sec the nor northern section of our business district wants to be a part of this, and I think that's a compliment to this end of the city that uh, is under the uh, the business association so um, I don't uh, I don't have an, an issue with this um, uh, with this uh, proposal I think it sounds like a win-win a for um, a lot of uh, a lot of people Great. But there is, excuse oh, me. don't go on hold on <laughs> there yes. is uh, there is there, it's not all uh, uh, commercial properties there is as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there is a building on corner of, if I'm not wrong, on Stalker and Brand. There is a condominium, it's the, or apartment building. Which so what we did, Councilman, is we excluded those parcels that were on the second floor and up, and we only included the commercial parcel on the bottom. So mm -hmm. we did exclude those, exclude those residential condos on that parcel and only kept the commercial condo on the oh. ground floor. Yes, Mr. Najarian, we have one more question. Okay. Well, I have, I have a couple. Mm -hmm. What, um, does the Downtown Glendale Association exist separate from this business district? Is their entire uh, existence based on managing and administering the CBD? Yes, that is correct. They are a nonprofit um, formed to administer the, the central business district uh, assessments. Will there be any uh, assuming this larger district is created, um, is there a, a different uh, different bylaws created to add additional members? Are there districts uh, for the members of the directors on that DGA, or is everything going to stay the same? Because you're basically doubling the size, or almost doubling it. Are you going to let more people in, or is it going to be the same group of people running it? So there, there's a range of board members cur that currently exist. I believe it's a minimum of six and a maximum of 13. Okay. Currently, there's seven board members. So the board can always be expanded. In fact, we have told the Stevenson family and others that we do want them to be. We want the people who have the apartment buildings on the west side to be involved, as well as the people north of the 134 to be involved. And the board can always expand as it needs to. But at this point, there's, I think, five or six open slots for the board. So it would be managed by the same nonprofit corporation. We would just expand the ability to represent all those property owners. Do they have an advocacy role on um, presenting issues to the, the council to they, weigh in on certain, certain issues that, like, we might be discussing tonight? Is that within their... Is that within their realm of uh, jurisdiction, or are they mainly focused on the maintenance issues and the administration of the funding? So that's an excellent question. And would you recommend, as someone that creates these, would you recommend that the DGA or any other governing board get involved in certain issues that are very touchy and inflammatory? Uh, well, every city I'm working has touchy and inflammatory issues. So the, the, I think the way this nonprofit needs to be understood is it is a district management corporation. It exists to manage the district, which is whether it's a website or dealing with homelessness, maintenance, special events, or whatever. That's what the purpose of the district is. If there is an issue that affects the district in one way or the other, then normally they will take a position one way or the other, as we did with the parking meter increases a few years ago. The city council and the economic development department wanted to do that, so that we weighed in. The council did what it believed to be appropriate, but we still weighed in because it affected the district. So it's normal for a district to make recommendations. If you were gonna put a homeless shelter in the middle of downtown, it would make sense to give input on that. So if it has to do, though, with a political uh, tax increase, 
That doesn't really affect the district, district. That's citywide for all intents and purposes. So the real litmus test is, does it affect the district? If it does, they should give their opinion one way or the other. And I would think that you would want to give their opinion one way or the other. So in all the districts that I manage, if it affects them and the geography that they represent, then they give input one way or the other. Yeah, I, I would not agree with you on that, especially on the cusp uh, of the creation of uh, this council's action to, to move this forward, that uh, they should perhaps take a, like a more apolitical role and not get so involved in an issue, any issue that would be so, uh, so charged as one that might come before this council later tonight. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want to say, council members, is um, this validates something that I talked about um, two years ago. There was an issue with a, uh, uh, a hotel that was being built on North Brand. And my comments were that Brand, according to the downtown uh, specific plan uh, that Alex Cooper and Associates prepared, Brand Boulevard being a signature street of the city of Glendale does not end at Glen Oaks, that it does extend to North Brand, uh, perhaps up to Stock or maybe even further. And that's the desire for a creation and extension of our downtown business district to those four or five blocks north of Glen Oaks, I think serves as a validation for my observations uh, during that previous discussion. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Jerry. <clears throat> One yes. more thing I want to add is, uh, just, to, just to follow up on what Councilmember Majarian was saying, weighing in on issues is different than taking a hardcore as a downtown uh, district association, DGA, Downtown Glendale Association, that represents so many, so many members. I don't know if the position was uh, put to vote by the members or not, but if the five or four or six members of the board make a decision and have a hardcore opinion on, on a very touchy issue, then there is a, there is a problem. I agree with Mr. Mr. Council Member Najarian. I think weighing in on issues, 100%. But when there is an issue that is very sensitive, when you have, I don't know how many hundred, several, several hundred or tens of, uh, how many members do we have in downtown Glendale Association? Well, there are a total of about 160. Okay, members. when you have 160 plus members, and uh, most of them may may disagree with your this, the board's decision on a very touchy issue, I think it should be put out to vote as well, and take a take a take a uh, solid decision as to what the overall opinion of the members of the association is, uh, instead of just sending a uh, you know taking a hardcore decision. So, anyways, uh, that's that's and, a lot. If I may, I, I, I disagree, and I think that if they represent the businesses, they are the businesses. And if there is an issue uh, that comes before the city council uh, that concerns businesses, that affects businesses, that impacts businesses, they should definitely have a voice in it, whether it is political, apolitical, whatever. If it affects businesses, they are the voice of our businesses, and they should have a right, the right to uh, write letters, to say, uh, whatever they, however they choose to um, get their opinions and their uh, feelings uh, out to the council. And I think it behooves us to listen to everyone that has an opinion. And that's my opinion. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, we just heard it. Thanks. Well, I don't disagree with, with, with what Council Member Devine was saying. What I'm saying is when their board is representing 160 plus businesses and maybe 10 businesses are not happy with one decision or another and the rest may not agree with that, that minority that is, is being affected or is, is, is disagreeing with the decision. I don't think the board, uh, any board, any other organization will do that to, to take a hardcore stand on an issue uh, that, uh, anyways, I, I, I was my opinion. You sure everyone? All right, okay. let's go on with this. So with that, and I believe that you may have uh, some speaker cards, um, the, the direction that we're seeking from council today is uh, there's three items. One is to receive and file the Greater Downtown Glendale Community Benefit District petition results. Uh, the second is to approve the resolution of intention to establish the Greater Downtown Glendale Community Benefit District of 2018 and to levy and collect assessments within such district. 
Um, and the third is a motion authorizing the city manager to sign the ballots for city-owned property in support of the community benefit district. As I mentioned, the city has now, it will be a total of 43 properties within this district. As a voting member, we are eligible to cast our vote as well. Um, and as discussed before, there's really no right or wrong, wrong approach to this. Uh, it's simply that we're looking for direction from the council whether you would wish uh, the city manager to, to uh, submit that ballot or perhaps you would prefer to have the voters uh, within this process just go ahead and vote without having the votes from the city. Clarification. Giving authority to the city manager to vote only to support the district or giving her the authority to vote upon time uh, that there's, you know, the vote comes forward and, and uh, authority is given to her to vote one way or the other? Correct, to vote one way or the other. Okay, so we're yes. not committing her to a yes vote uh, by giving her the authority to vote. That's uh, how I understood it, but I will look over to Jillian. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, it's uh, per the direction of the, of the City Council with regard to the, the city-owned properties. So it could be in opposition or in support of the right. creation of the new Because district. we may get input from those 150 other businesses that aren't in favor of that, of the district, and at such point we may instruct the city manager not to vote for the district. We're representatives, too, of the businesses. Let's not forget that. So I just want to be clear on that. Uh, depending on uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Council Member Najarian, the motion is written in support of, but if there is a, a different direction that the Council would, would like to take, by all means, um, I will take that direction from the City Council. I, that's, I, uh, that's recommendation I, number three, correct? Right. Yes, I, if I may. <coughs> yes, of course. Um, I think the City should stay out of this. I think we should leave it up to the businesses that are involved uh, just to uh, uh, maintain a... Uh, not a transparency, but a, well, I guess it would be a transparency that we're not going to influence this vote one way or another, yes or no. Let the businesses decide. And, so you uh, want the businesses to be in the city's business, but business, the city not to be in the businesses? Correct. Business? Yeah, I that, guess that's unfair. Well, well, that's a little unfair. Well, if that was the case, not what I'm saying. if that was the case, the petition would they wouldn't have 32 percent uh, signatures if city wanted to stay out of it, because more than half of the the properties listed in this petition that form that 32 percent is the city. So if we were going to stay out of it, we should have stayed out of it from the beginning. Are the cities and on that list? Yes. Oh. Yeah. I agree with Mr. Oh. Garbetja. That it's makes here. sense. This is a, a page and a half of three and a half pages is the city's properties. And it's going to be even more with the new district, right? The the, dis the uh, properties that are included in the in your summary include the properties okay. that will be in the new district. Okay. So the the city has about 5.85 uh, percent of the total properties within the new district. Uh, the in the thought process was by allowing the the DGA to move forward with uh, at least the petition process. At that point, then you are still enabling the voters to make the decision when they are able to cast their ballots. Look, we don't want to. I, I, I think this is this is kind of counterintuitive because if we go out and say we the the third largest property owner in this district already voted yes on it, what's the point of having an election? You see what I'm saying? I mean, by well, by that, approving it I, tonight. I'd like to clarify you know, that though. You know, uh, but we that we did not say that we're in favor of of the district. What we said um, uh, by way of the petition was that we are in favor of no, a the vote, resolution. A the vote resolution. being taken um, by the uh, members of the district as well as the uh, larger district, ultimately the new district. And so the petition only said, do you want to have the option to have a vote taken? No decision in terms of whether it should be a, a yes Fair vote enough. or a no vote. But how about the resolution that's before us? Is that for to support the? The motion before you today is to give you the option of um, if you're in favor of this, to allow me as, as the city manager uh, to sign the ballot in favor. Now, if you're 
Um, not sure about that. It could be uh, what Mr. Nojarian said. It could be in, in um, not not in favor. And so it all depends on what council. Or we direction. can instruct you to abstain. Or you can instruct at me that to point. Well, there absolutely you know, abstain. At that point. So yes. I'm not saying we're not in favor of it. I don't want to create this wrong image out there. But what I'm saying is, if we say we are in favor of it, it means the third third largest property owner is saying yes to it already. We, then what's the point of having an election in the near future? Because with two properties, you can you can pass the whole thing. Well, that's, so that's why it's well, important then to just have the businesses and, and leave. Uh, it's the not city the businesses; it's the property owners only. The property owners let yeah. them decide. Well, all right. So I agree with Mr. Najari. I think what? when the time comes, we can. But the time is here. We have a motion in front of us. Either we vote for the motion, or we don't. Well, just no one what moves it. And we. Well, I would propose that we that can we, we can. Can we, we have, we have some speaker cards? Can we, before we conclude, okay. can we I, give a chance to the speakers? Sure. I mean, I want to wrap up too, but so let's hear the, uh, uh, do you have something to add? I, I was going to, to, I think was going to answer the question that you asked. Um, moving forward, if you wanted, you could adopt one and two and, and not, not adopt number three. We could bring this back to you sometime before July 31st. That way, if you do get input as council members, uh, you can give us direction at that time. But July 31st is when we, this would be back uh, in front of you and ballots would be opened on that day. So we would need some direction if you wanted to vote before that time. Okay, very well. Thank you. So we have three speaker cards. And uh, the first speaker is Rick Lemo. And I know Marco Lemandri spoke here, unless you have something to add. How much time do you need, Mr. Lemo? Hopefully no more than about four minutes. I'll try and make Let's it quick. Let's do it. No, take your time. Um, because I first want to take the opportunity to thank you very much for your questions and for your debating on this. But I think it's really very helpful for you to know some history that I don't think any of you or m most of you know, maybe uh, Council Member Najarian. First and foremost, we were called upon almost seven years ago by the city to form this district. The members of the district did not step forward and say, let's do these services. The city was in a situation financially where they could not provide the services that business needed in that area. And so the district uh, didn't get formed when it was done as a, a business improvement district. But then city manager came to me and said, can you do this a different way? And we got a community benefit district. That's one point of history that's crucial for you to know. And the reason is the majority of dollars, the clear majority of dollars, come from two people who utilize almost zero services from the district. The majority of dollars come directly from the Glendale Galleria and the Americana Ed Brand. And both of us felt we had the charge to make all of Brand better because part of what we were supposed to be doing is lift up the whole city. So that's a bit of history you need to know. I think you also need to know the history from our board meetings that have taken place in regards to the renaming of Maryland. The district board voted not to take a position. When we took a position, it was because the businesses within the district came to us complaining. And so we said, fine, we'll carry that position forward to the city. We do not get involved in political races. In fact, we haven't even been involved in political issues. We view this as nothing more than carrying forward because our constituents are the property owners in the district. And quite frankly, we, we have people that are tenants whose property owners give them permission to come and say, you know, take care of us. It could be anything from not cleaning up properly to they didn't want that street renamed, and they made it economic. We didn't want to carry that position forward, so we waited. We chatted with other members in the community, and we chatted with the Chamber of Commerce. I even had, I would suggest, at least 45 <coughs> minutes of talking with the mayor and having him understand the positions that we were representing and me understanding your positions. So it really seems almost like we want to give Marco Lamandri is not a very good driver. If he's speeding, why should I get a ticket? The district, what we're basically doing is we're shooting the messenger, and that doesn't seem fair. Last but not least, 
I think it is important for the city to support this district. We supported the city's not getting involved at all when we first formed the district. They were gonna take a wait and see and it made perfect sense. Now that the city has profited very well from the services provided by the district, for the city to take anything but a supportive role seems grossly unfair. Now, if you don't want that, I will tell you that it is going to have a negative effect on two of our voters that carry a lot of weight. Okay, and what's the risk? The district ends December 31st of 2018. That is the, that is the risk. Because if the city's not gonna support it, I have a very hard time convincing our ownership that they should support it. And I happen to know that there are two other groups that do represent a majority of the votes. It's like, why do it if the city doesn't want it? We, we don't wanna do that. So I think we should keep all of those things in mind because our goal, remember, we're volunteers like you. We're just trying to do a better job away from our properties. There's no benefit to the Galleria and little benefit, if any, to the Americana for what goes on with the district. So I think that's important to keep in mind. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer those. Thank you, Mr. Lemo. Anyone yeah, I do have some questions. Nigerian. So we got your letter, Mr. Lemo, and I guess a couple of these businesses came to you and talked about business disruption. Did you, uh, did you inquire as to the unfortunate, to quote, financial impact they would be forced, forced to withstand along with possible disruption to their businesses for the months beyond the change. Did they say, look, these are gonna be my costs, I'm gonna go out of business? Uh, well, first of all, that's two questions, but I'll only answer one right off the bat. First and foremost, I have to say what my board has empowered me to say, which is today we're supposed to be speaking on the renewal of our district. We did the letter so that we did not get into an, any level of debate with council. But what I will tell you is this, and I shared this with the mayor. What they told us was, I cannot afford new stationery. I cannot afford new business cards. I cannot afford anything that I've used over the years that has Maryland on it. That's all they've told us. I don't remember anybody ever saying that they would go out of business because I mean, if they are gonna go out of business from that, they're dangling by a thread to begin with. But, but I'm, I, I really, I mean, I don't wanna get into a debate with you because remember, we're carrying forward, and by the way, as much as the city has put money into that area, so have we. We've not only put a lot of money into tables, chairs, cleanup, meeting with the owners and giving them ways to help their business, but we have also participated in promotions uh, I believe we've got one even coming up with the uh, uh, soccer uh, and, and different things like that. So, you know, we this is not our opinion. This is opinion of our district. And if the majority of people in our district would have also said, hey, you know, we don't want you to take the position. But remember, we don't put everything out to a vote between the 160 members. First of all, most property members, they're just not that involved. Secondly, exactly right. secondly, and even more importantly than that, they say to me, why are you bothering us? We put you in there to do that. So again, if you don't, and I, I want this to be as cordial as possible. If we really think there's problems with the district, then in December, those are things that I think the city should take on. Remember, we're taxing ourselves. Every one of our businesses is taxing themselves. So if the district is not something that you're proud to have around, then that, those are the actions I think you need to take. I those aren't maybe this in a wrong, uh, wrong direction me, because me, that's not what we said. Let me if pursue my questions here. Let me pursue okay. my questions. Um, and I'm not here to complain about the way you run the district in terms of the maintenance issues and the, the business development. I think your letter from the DGA at this time is the most ill-timed and ill-conceived letter that could possibly come from an organization that's seeking support from the city. Can I ask you a question? Did you, did you read our letter? Yes, I did, and okay. I quoted it to you right there. Did, and I think you, that the, that the, the argument did that these the businesses page? are gonna go out of business for months to come okay. I, is completely, I think it's really important to is, note that there's a line that you're okay. carrying for them, Mr. Lemon. Wait a and that's what, do I get that's answers? what, is that, that's not true. Just, Mr. Lemon, just. Let's Let me explain what actually Let's happened. not speak over each other, though. Are that you done, letter Mr. was written on May 23rd 
of this year. I know that for a fact. I read it yesterday. I read it on May 24th. And what came this morning? I got it today. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Did you get the whole letter? On the first page that was sent to all of you this morning was, please reiterate our May 23rd opinion. We didn't change anything. That was, and that letter, by the way, was sent on the same day that the Chamber of Commerce letter was sent on May Stated 23rd. May 3rd. I don't know about this 23rd. That or, or May 3rd. I thought it was May 23rd, to be honest with you. I was reading it while I was driving. Thought it was May 23rd, but it's okay, May 3rd. That, that's even more so the case. All we did was reiterate that letter. And it was a May 23rd letter that, by the way, for those people who have not had the benefit of reading the letter, covered some areas that I can't believe you've totally skipped over, but I figured you must be busy too. One of the main areas was, we are in agreement. Something special for a, and I'm gonna use the mayor's words, something special for a community that has this many people that represent a certain national heritage, something should be done to recognize that. And what we said for a variety of reasons was, maybe making it the Art Sock Art Plaza, because that's what we do there, would work. But remember, we all offered an alternative that was equal to pretty much what the chamber suggested. We don't care what you do with it. That's your business. We don't name streets. But it's important for you to know that there are people out there that are going to say, at the very least, I want money for my business cards, I want money for my letterhead, I want you to help me out with advertising. That's, that's what I think is the message that you need to hear from the district. But it's not our opinion, it's the, it's the opinion we're carrying forward of our members. And I think any mischaracterization of that is grossly unfair, including the date when the letter was written. It was not written today. It was not in any way, shape, or form written. And by the way, this is the, and I work in a lot of cities, I'm having a hard time fathoming that a district would ever be tied to business people, some of which may be citizens, who just voice their opinion through a district they pay money into. Did I answer your question? There was really no question. You were kind of rambling for a while, but, but I understood what you said. I still disagree, but I, I heard what you said. I think we're going to the wrong direction. We, we never said we don't want to support the district. The city has been supporting the district as well, and we are the third largest uh, property owner in that district. And we want a better district for our city. Of course we do. Americana benefits from it, Galleria benefits from it, all the businesses benefit from it, they benefit from it, everybody benefits from it. Some people complain about it, most people benefit from it, and they, they, they love the, the, the work that you do. That's not, if we, if we discuss the issues because we care about it, we shouldn't get offended because we discuss the issues. We, I, we, that's I promise you I'm not offended. Well, I, well you're, this is just one more volunteer voice was, uh, uh, saying something else, but I it's may okay. be passionate, but, but I'm not offended. Yeah. Good, so we are passionate too. So uh, just the fact that we're discussing issues to see what's the best, you should appreciate that. I mean, we, 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 you shouldn't get you know, too overpassionate about it because what we wanted to do is what's the best for the city. So. And I asked the question, if you wanted to stay out of it, you should have stayed out of it from the beginning. If the, we decide to stay out of it, we stay out of it. We are not here to uh, not vote for a district if the, the businesses in North Prime want to join the South Prime. What is it for us to, to not vote for it? And, but what I was saying was voting for it today by saying yes to city manager's authority to move forward and, you know, in a positive note, it just, uh, you know, makes that that uh, that election irrelevant. That's all I was saying. Well, and see, it, it really doesn't if, if we get the, the good return. I mean, quite frankly, if we just counted the city, Americana, and the Galleria, we would hope, and we were fortunate enough to get other votes last time, but we wouldn't want the three of us making the decision on the district. Exactly. Especially in a situation right now where this is kind of historic. They came to us and asked to, us to extend our district. We had no plans of expanding the district. We had no plans of even, we hadn't made the decision to renew the district yet. So we're just doing them all at one time because we <coughs> saved $75,000 by doing that. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Mayor? Not from me. Thank you, Mr. Thank Lemo. You. Next speaker is Ronald, uh, Roland Ketikian.
How much time do you need? Good afternoon. Four minutes. <laughs> four minutes? I was going to say as four? much as that. Uh, <laughs> four minutes? Or four minutes, four minutes. It's like 40 minutes. But. Uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, my name is Roland, uh, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Roland Kadikin, and I live at 1155 North Brand Boulevard. And that's a condominium unit that there's 49 units in there. And I was pleased to hear the gentleman say that we are not included in the district. But when he said it, I reviewed the meets and bounds of the description that they have in their report. Nowhere in there does it say the second level and up is not part of the district. So I had come here to talk and say uh, we were not included in this petition drive. Our, uh, we didn't get any notice of it. Seems that was intentional, but the meets and bounds that are written in here does not include any exclusion of our units. So 10 years from now, when we're all gone, and uh, you know somebody looks at this document, they're going to say, why isn't every single condominium unit in Verdugo Towers being charged the taxes that they're supposed to be charged? And then we're going to be left with a problem. So I just want to make the record very clear that if there's an exclusion of all the condominium units in Verdugo Towers, that it accurately be indicated in, in the documents that is being stated. Uh, that's my first concern. Because when I was reviewing these documents, I reviewed exceptions. I reviewed in the document whether there's any exceptions. And it said, absolutely no exceptions. So if we're in the meets and bounds, there is absolutely no exceptions. The, the way we are charged as residents, we are charged about 20 cents. So for a building of, uh, per square foot, for a building of our size, the tax is going to be somewhere between 15 to $25,000. That's as much as Nordstrom is being charged. And we certainly do not generate the foot traffic that Nordstrom does. So I, obviously, we were not included in this petition drive. So we have no representation in this. Our building is about 49 condos. So approximately, some people have two units there. So approximately 47 or 45. Uh, property owners never participated in this petition. And also, this particular uh, document talks about um, the future residential, future condos might come in. Uh, and again, I don't know what's going to be happening, whether with our property is going to be included in this or not. But what kind of a representation are condo owners going to get in this huge business district? This is primarily for business purposes. What are condo owners, as a minority in that group, going to get some sort of a security or assurances that their voice is going to be heard, that they're going to have a say in the organization that runs this business district? Their entire purpose is for business purposes. There's nothing wrong with it, but I think it's important that uh, condo owners have a say in a district that they are being forced into that we never have the opportunity to vote for. And at least the documents here is not clear that our APN numbers are excluded. There are certain ones that are excluded, but I don't see my APN number or the other units in the building that I can tell. So I hope uh, we make the record crystal clear uh, that we are not at least accurately indicated in the re report that we did not get any kind of petition to participate in this. And uh, we are opposed to any tax being Im imposed on us without us having a say in it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Ketikin. Mr. Lemo, can you respond to the question that was posed, or, or Mr. Lamander, whoever? I think it's a legitimate question. Residential yes. units are included in, the, in a business district, district that's meant to benefit the businesses. How are their concerns going to be? addressed well, or how their voice going to be heard in this district? In the first place, they're not being assessed. They are not. Right, right. Okay. They're not being assessed. And I think the gentleman stated he did not see his parcel on Section 7 of the, because all the parcels are listed that are included. So they are not included. The assessment that currently is in the plan is the same assessment for residential condos that we had in 2012. That has not changed. So we anticipated, we didn't know it was going to be apartments or condos when they were built on the West End. 
So at this point, they are not included for the entire reason we did not have the ability to outreach, plus we did not believe the overall district was benefiting those residents up at Stalker and North Brand. Mm -hmm. So that's why we excluded them. The ground floor, which is commercial, yes, it should be included, but the upper stairs were not. So it's in the plan that we did not mention them in particular because we didn't put them in the database. If they were in the database, they would have gotten a petition. If they're in the database, they would get a ballot. They're not, so they're not going to be assessed. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Lomendi. Thank you. All right, folks. So we have to take action on this item one way or another. I'll open the floor to you, Mr. Najari. Well, I'm ready to move uh, one and two and hold off on number three until such time as we're a little closer to the... Uh, okay. That would be 2 A and B. Two A and B. Yes, 2 A and B. So there's a motion for 2 A and B. You can you know, make comments and I'll second. maybe second it. I'll second it. Okay. Now we have a council member who's not here. Do you have anything to say, Mr. Agajeni? You've been very quiet. Suspicious. Well, I'll fill in the gap. I mean, they've done a good job, uh, definitely a good job in the downtown area, and there have been many complaints from residents on that northern stretch of Brand Boulevard. Uh, and I think it's just what that area needs. So I have, I have full confidence uh, in their ability to maintain the district and, and as their uh, charter says, to promote business, um, uh, the lighting and the uh, beautification, the tree maintenance, all the other things that they do, so long as they don't write any letters to us. Okay. I'm happy with our, our colleague doesn't want to vote on this, so I want to call. Oh, I guess not. I guess not. No, he does want to vote on this. Okay, so why don't we have a roll call on this motion? Did you, are you familiar with what the motion is? Did you yes, hear? are we, are we, are we voting? Moving item, move to items A and, um, I'm one sorry, and two? one and two. Holding it was off. seconded, okay. holding off on three. Okay. And I assume three will be brought back at some point because otherwise resolution two is kind of meaningless. We'll bring it back in July. Roll call, please. Councilmember Agajanian. Sorry. Okay. So the now three there's a comment. may affect the other ones later. Is that okay if I vote now and then? I'm sorry? May impact the other three may impact the other issues. Well, You're not taking a vote on. on we're not taking yeah. a vote on three today. That's not on the motion. So the motion is only for items one and two. And I believe you seconded it. Seconded it. Oh, you did. I'm sorry. So it's been seconded. Roll call. Council Member Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpetian? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is a long item. Move to adjourn. We have a second. Just an adjourn. And we're adjourned at 524 p.m. <laughs>